let's move on to our very first panel this morning. Um, I am I'm, I was thrilled when I was asked to 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 chair this event. Uh, a big thank you again, I mean, Mental Reform, for asking me that pretty much every speaker that uh, that is going to be speaking today, I've interviewed at some stage in my career as a journalist. So it's it's brilliant for me to be to to be in in your presence again. So our very first panel is called Mental Health and the LGBTI Plus Community, and on this panel we have three. Fantastic speakers, um, Professor Agnes Higgins, who of course is the chairperson of mental health reform. Uh, Agnes is a professor in mental health at the School of Nursing at Midwifery uh, and Midwifery. Uh, that's my second favorite prof profession after uh, psychotherapists, it's midwives. Because <laughs> uh, my wife and I had two uh, home births. So uh, our midwife is uh, really one of our closest friends. And I really think if you, if you, if you, if you are privileged to get to know your midwife uh, and make her a friend, do so because they're amazing human beings. <laughs> um, okay, so so that's uh, Agnes, uh, who is um, who is going to really speak to us about the prevalence and impact and severity of mental health difficulties within our community. Agnes, take it away. Uh, you... Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen, uh, and hopefully it will work. My screen. Good morning, uh, and thank you, Dale, for that introduction. I will not try and uh, use your full uh, name. Uh, and thanks, Fiona, and the mental health team in uh, mental health reform for asking me to speak for the about, about 15 minutes on prevalence of mental health difficulties within the LGBTI community. And those of you who know me know that I uh, can speak for a couple of days on this subject. So I'm going to try to be brief and just to make some critical uh, points as we go through. But the first uh, point that I wanna make, if I can find the key for moving on, is that when we start to talk about mental health issues within the LGBT community, I'm always very uh, conscious that in the way that we may co construct identities that all LGBT people, as uh, a, a friend of mine within the LGBT community that reminds me are kind of we, the danger is that we construct people as mad and bad and that we pathologize LGBT identities and that we kind of frame people very much within a kind of a vulnerable victim uh, and that the message that we, we inadvertently give to the younger LGBT community that mental health issues and experiencing mental health problems is a normal part of their journey. And of course, equally, then we give a, a message to non-LGBT community that, you know, what we need is a bit of tolerance and acceptance. And in a lot of cases, then that the heteronormative cisgender culture uh, go, and the structures that maintain that go unquestioned. So I want to start, I suppose, this morning by just reminding us of some of the positive pieces. So from the LGBT Ireland study, what we know is that, you know, it, in terms of people that were involved in that study, which was over 2000, that the mean score for happiness was 6.62. You say, well, what does that mean in the context of the uh, general population? And from the Eurostat um, Irish national statistics, the, the, yeah, the mean that came out on that was around seven, uh, varying from 6.9 in 2016 to around seven in, in 2020. So which suggests that you know the vast majority of people within the LGBTI community are doing well. Now, why we this what this slide does show is that we do see variation within within the community. But I suppose one of the messages that I want to give is that you know that the vast majority of people are doing well. Similarly, when we we take kind of um, validated and tried and tested measures around depression, anxiety, and stress. What we're seeing again is that you know well over 50% of people are doing well and that are they are within the normal range uh, and then that there is a 40% that are outside the normal range. So all in all that there is a cohort there that, that certainly are outside the normal range of mental health issues. And I suppose the other thing that we know from, from studies is that as people age within the LGBT community, we they have a certain a real capacity of building resilience. Um, 
and that is again, as I suppose, a positive message. But when we look at the international literature on mental health and mental health problems, there isn't a paper that you pick up from the very early um, King's systematic view, review, right to more, much more recent stuff that, that has been published. And in respect of what country you're looking at, whether it's in England and Wales, Australia or Canada, that all of the international literature, all of the reviews are highlighting uh, mental health problems within the LGBTI community. So we are very good in, in Ireland at saying, oh, you know, this wouldn't happen here. Uh, and I put this slide up in terms of, you know, it wouldn't happen. We are such a good country. You know, we are second in the good country index. Um, and that, you know, issues, we are a very welcoming country. We're a very uh, empathetic country. Uh, you know, so I'm going to focus, I suppose, to move away from that idea, I want to focus more mainly on the Irish literature in terms of what we do know from the Irish context. I suppose from the uh, LGBT Ireland study, what we, we, we see when we look at the depression, anxiety and stress levels, that uh, we have, a, while we have 53%, 58% and 64% within the normal, we have at least 20% uh, in, that are indicating severe or extremely severe depression and similarly 26% in terms of anxiety and 15% uh, in terms of stress. And I'm focusing on the severe and ex extremely severe. Um, and that is quite a large uh, number of people that we, we do need to be concerned about. When we look at it within the, what we know from the recent study in 2008 within the LGBT migrant community in Ireland, again, we see severe levels of uh, depression and anxiety and stress up in, within the 20% uh, bracket. And how does this, I suppose, compare to the general population in Ireland? In terms of the Healthy Ireland survey, what you're seeing is that they are indicating that about 10% of the population uh, experience a mental health problem in their lifetime. While, while it may vary across the age profile, it certainly isn't up in the 20, 25, 30% uh, uh, region. When we look at it, uh, and we look at it with, the, when we look and see that it's not kind of the LGBT community is not a homogeneous group that within the LGBT Ireland study, uh, the people who were doing well were the gay men, followed by lesbian women, followed by people who identified as uh, bisexual, and then the, the groups that had the highest levels of uh, depression, anxiety and stress was the transgender and the intersex group. When we, we, we crunch the numbers and you look across uh, the age profile, what we're seeing is the high levels of distress within the 14 to 18 year olds. And then it, it in, improving as people age. But equally, we have very high levels within the 19 to 25 and the 26 uh, to 35 year age group. So if we take a comparison and we take the LGBT Ireland data and we look at the My World survey data, which is of the general population of young people, what is, I suppose, quite shocking uh, is that you are, what you are seeing in the, when we look at the LGBT Ireland for depression, you have 34%. And whereas in a, a near comparable, it's not exactly in terms of age profile, but it's a near comparable, and they have used the same uh, survey instruments that you have an 8%. So in fact, across for the severe, extremely severe, uh, whether it's in depression, anxiety or stress, what you are seeing that it's nearly four times the rate within the, the young LGBTI community. Within that study, there was also questions around suicide thoughts and whether people had tried to take their own lives. And what we could see is that 59% have responded yes to seriously having thought about ending their own lives. 
44% in the past year. And in terms of then taking, try, making an attempt to, to take their own lives, 24% responded yes to that. And 26% had tried to end their life in the past year. Now, how does this compare to uh, the My World study for the young people? Again, what we're seeing is this very significant difference. In the My World study, it was 7% uh, who had indicated that they had tried to take their own lives, whereas in the LGBT Ireland study, it was, was 21%. So again, it's nearly three times as uh, the rate. And what, when we, we look at it in terms of when we break it down in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, what we are seeing again, that the groups that that there is a high incidence of suicidal thoughts and suicide attempt is within the transgender uh, intersex community. But that's not to minimize by in any way the, the rates within the gay, lesbian and bisexual community. In terms of self-harm, we, we asked a, a series of questions around self-harm and 34% of the participants had a lifetime history of, uh, of self-harm. And nearly half, which was 50%, uh, reported self-harm within the, within the previous year to the study. And again, when we, we look at it across, what we are seeing here in terms of self-harm rates, that the, there is the very high rates within those who identified as bisexual. Um, again, an equally high rate within the intersex and transgender community. If we wanted to, to just pick out the young people in terms of those aged 19 to 25, what we are again seeing is the significantly higher rates within that group when we compare to my world study with 43% uh, reporting self-harm within the LGBT Ireland study and 21% of young people within uh, the uh, my world study. When we look across the age profile, what we, you're, we are, you see is the trend is that, it, that suicidal thoughts, self-harm, attempted suicide is high in, in the, the younger age group. And then in, in most situations, it, it, it starts to decrease as people age, except for we say the attempted suicide, uh, attempted to take their own lives is, is increasing as, again as people age. In that study, and I think it's important to, to that 60% of people said that the, their self-harm was related to some way to their LGBT identity. Now, it wasn't the only reason. Other people talked about uh, just a desire to feel some things, to escape pain, to release tension, to calm themselves. And we know that the motivations for self-harm are quite complex, but, but I think this, this is a striking statistic that 60% you felt that it was in some way related to their LGBT identity. And within that uh, study, there's a lot of information in relation to their experiences of discrimination and bullying within schools. And, but I don't want to go into that because I know Marin is going to speak uh, uh, later. We have very little information in relation to the area of eating disorders within um, Ireland, but what we this is a very hot off the press and to just off the press in terms of in the Journal of Eating Disorders. And I suppose what we look at here is this line on the conclusion. And again, what it's, it's, it's identifying from a, a, a detailed review of the literature in, and the, of the international literature that LGBT adults and, and adolescents experience greater incidence of eating disorders. And what we are seeing is that within the, from an eating disorders perspective, that there is variations in relation to gay men, bisexual and transgender adults, were at an, at an increased risk of eating disorders. Whereas there was mixed results in terms of people who identified for, uh, as lesbian. The other area where we, we see uh, an increased incidence when we compare to the general population is in, in the area of substance misuse and drug use. 
And this again is a, a very recent study and for, in, within the United States, which was tracking quite a number of um, pieces of data across a number of years. And what we are seeing when you compare to men in terms of uh, the odds ratio, we see it higher for the gay men and bisexual than the reference group of heterosexual men. But equally, and the same for women in terms of lesbian and bisexual people who identify as bisexual people. But what you are seeing here in this uh, statistic is the, the very high uh, incidence and the high risk for bisexual women in terms of uh, substance misuse and drug use. There are other areas we could speak about in terms of uh, alcohol, smoking, uh, and a lot of, um, but I just say they, I suppose, are the headline pieces that we, we need to think about. And I suppose when we look at the complexity, the reasons for people within the LGBTI community uh, to be at increased risk, there is a quite a complexity of reasons. You know, a lot of it sitting within the heteronormative and gender biased society, which really doesn't see uh, anything except cisgender and uh, straight relationships, despite all of the, the advances we kind of think we have been making. Uh, and in some cases we have made. I suppose the other, from the older people, it, a lot of their experiences has been around being pathologized and criminalized People, the internalization of the heteronegativity where people have to hide their identity and live a dual life. For parental rejection for people, um, you know, when they come out. And what we do know from the data that coming out can be good for people's mental health, but if coming out in a very negative culture can be extremely bad for people's mental health because it exposes them to a greater level of uh, discrimination and maybe homophobia, transphobia, biphobia. Uh, and bullying within the schools, work or online and wider community. There is some stuff there that on the negative religious experiences and its impact on people's mental health. And I suppose the high rates of hate crime, which in many cases the transgender community uh, experiences experience more than other communities. And a lot of this is framed within Meyer's idea of minority stress. And I suppose the longer I'm, I'm researching and speaking to people within the LGBT community and working with them, that I'm beginning to think that that concept of minority stress, where while it was very good at the time in moving away from getting people to, to think outside the notion that it was something uh, inherent within somebody that was, uh, it was identified themselves as LGBTI, uh, to look at the wider context of society. I do think today that minority stress is, is nearly a euphemism and that maybe we should be talking about it in terms of embedded structural trauma. And I still used the word at the very outset uh, on you know, experiencing the trauma of moving. And I think that we maybe need to call it what it is. Uh, and it is about embedded structural trauma. I think one of the, pieces that I want to highlight and, uh, is that the LGBT community are more than gender and sexual orientation. While I've spoken very much about I suppose, gender sexual orientation and then tracked it across uh, from an age profile, there is people come with a, a, a race, a culture, an ethnicity. They come in, in terms of access to socioeconomic uh, um, activity and money. They come with maybe with a, an experience of a very distant from a disability point of view, they come out of a very different family context, they come from very religious, different religious beliefs, um, with, they come with very different educational backgrounds. And I suppose they also live in, in contexts where legislation is very, very different. And I suppose, so there is, people have multiple identities as opposed to their uh, gender and sexual orientation uh, identity. And we need to be conscious of all, how those, inter, those identities intersect. And this is uh, 
a very interesting uh, paper uh, on the fragmented inclusion uh, that was recently published. And it was really highlighted how people who experience mental health problems and LGBT and are identified as LGBT feel that they, they can't access either community. That in within the mental health community, they, they found it challenging because there was barriers because of the lack of LGBT affirmative practice and practitioners. And within the LGBT community, they felt excluded because of their mental health issues. So, okay, we could, as I put, put up here, we need to que queer mad spaces, but we also need to mad queer spaces. But even at that, we need to move beyond that piece because in terms of what about all the other identities that people come from with. So if, if I happen to be identify as LGBT and I also experience an intellectual disability, or if I'm LGBT and I am I identify within the, tra the traveler community, or I'm a migrant, is, is another part aspect of my identity. So it's not just about thinking about LGBT issues and mental health issues. I think we need to, to, to think about the intersectionality and see that the wide variability within the community. Uh, and I'm stealing this idea from Daly's uh, work in 2007 and from a quote from um, one of the, the participants in that study where they say, it isn't one wire or any one wire it doesn't contain the bud. It's the grouping of multiple wires together that creates the cage. And the more isms you have to deal with, the harder it is. So it, well, we can have the heterosexism and genderism, but also we need to think about racism, disabilism, ageism, and all the other isms and how they intersect uh, in terms of our identity uh, and impact on mental health and mental wellness. And I, because if we, do, we, we, we reduce life, I think, to just sexual orientation and gender identity and mental health, then we certainly don't see the rainbows and the variability, one across the LGBT community, but equally the impact of all the other identities that we, 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 we hold and bring to our lives. And that if we, we, in that way, I suppose we need to focus on our interventions that challenge and dismantle multiple systems of power, not just in terms of the structures that maintain the, the gendered piece and the sexual orientation piece, but also the, the structures that maintain exclusion because I have other, uh, uh, whether it's a mental health disability or another disability, or because I come from uh, a community, we say like the traveler community or the migrant com community. So that is all I wanna say. I hope I have kept my 10, 15 minutes and to say thank you very much for listening. Still, you're on mute. Oh, I'm on mute. Uh, no, uh, Professor Magnus, uh, Agnes, I could listen to you all day. I've just realized the sun has come out here in Black Horse Avenue. <laughs> it's coming right at me here. Um, my God, my mind is blown, but I, like I've heard you speak so many times um, and I, I'm now approaching everything as a, as a trainee psychotherapist, you know? So, so a lot of the information has, uh, there's some very stark figures, especially around the uh, in the self-harm, you know, and 60% of people who self-harm would say uh, it was contributed quite largely by their sexuality or gender identity. And the other thing that I, I before we move on to the next speaker, that is, I, I am very grateful to you because I think I've just found the topic of my thesis. Oh. Like, for years, I always used the term minority stress. I remember like it was yesterday when I think it was about a third year or 40 in, in, into my show Global Village in, on News Talk where I talked about minority stress and I had Thomas McCann who is a, a member of the traveling community who set up a counseling service. I had Salome from Akidwa speaking from as, as a perspective of a, of a African woman and then I had uh, I can't remember I think it was Moninia I think but we were talking about minority stress and how it really does impact everyone the same uh, irrespective of whether you're gay or straight or you know from an um, ethnic minority group or whatever but really the term minority stress totally just minimizes the whole thing because oh yeah it's a little bit of stress what are you giving out about you know but embedded structural trauma 
That's my thesis, Agnes. Like, <laughs> if I was in the room with you, I'd hug you. <laughs> oh, well, no, actually, I wouldn't be able to hug you. But you know what I, I would do. All right, so listen, moving on to our next speaker. That's my Thank mind. Is blown. Um, now, normally, uh, any any speaker would be would be quite quite apprehensive to follow uh, after Professor Agnes, um, uh, for, for her, uh, Agnes Higgins, for after her presentation, but not the next speaker, because we are joined by Moninja Griffith, who, of course, we know uh, is the CEO of Belong To, and, uh, and she's going to talk about mental health and younger and the younger members of the, of the LGBTI plus community. Um, Moninja, we are very welcome. Thanks so much, Till, and um, Oh, uh, Agnes is such a legend um, and such a fantastic ally. Uh, thank you, Professor, always, as always, for uh, your wise words and uh, for just being such an amazing ally and always being at the end of the uh, phone for m many of us activists in the community when we need to check something. And, and I'd like to echo Dill's sentiments that embedded trauma, uh, structural trauma, absolutely nails it. And I'm going to be changing. Um, uh, my presentations from here on out. Okay, I'm just going to share my presentation here. Great stuff. Okay, so um, as Dil said, my name is Melinda Griffith. I'm CEO of Belong to Youth Services. I've been there five years now. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and just, I suppose, a little bit about who we are and what we do for those of you who don't know us. Uh, so we, we belong to have been around since uh, 2003 and the core of our work really I suppose is the is the youth work um, so we provide one-to-one -one information and advice to LGBT young people and we and we also provide youth groups so we currently are running five youth groups weekly we have a one for over 18s one for under 18s and L, LGB gals and the non-binary pals um, and a young trans and non-binary group. And then there's a new young persons group as well. But our, our um, youth workers have been really busy um, answering queries on phone, uh, WhatsApp, uh, email um, as well, and just supporting young people, signposting them when they need uh, extra support. We also support a, a host of other, um, a net network of about 50 other LGBT youth, work, youth groups around Ireland. And then we do a lot of work in schools and with other services, <clears throat> excuse me, to make them safe places. To, so to try and stop the harm, I suppose, being done to LGBT young people in the first place. So what do we know about um, LGBT young people's mental health? Um, well, look, Professor Higgins has outlined uh, uh, quite a lot already, and um, this slide is obviously going to change on uh, for for future um, for future presentations. But you know, as said before, it's not being born LGBTI that's going to um, you know automatically say that you'll have a mental health uh, issue, but it's the stigma and the prejudice that we face on a daily basis. Um, uh, in our lives or from the structures or from the systems that we encounter uh, that chip away at, I suppose, our resilience and, um, and then can have a, a devastating impact on us. So some of the evidence base um, in relation to um, our, our mental health and especially I'm going to talk about young people's mental health. Uh, Professor Higgins has already, already spoken about the LGBT Ireland report and just to, to a quick recap. So in terms of the young people, they're twice as likely to self-harm, three times as likely to uh, experience suicide ideation and four times as likely to experience extreme uh, stress or uh, depression because um, of their, their experiences of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia in society. Um, we did a campaign um, in 2016 called Better Out Than In, did some focus work with young people to really find out why um, uh, there wasn't uh, a great uh, history, I suppose, of, of help-seeking behaviour amongst the young people we were working with. And the heartbreaking results from that work were that a lot of LGBT people felt that post -mar the MARF and gender recognition that they should be feeling happy, that they were feeling guilty that they weren't coping. Um, some of them were saying, you know, I've just come out to my parents as LGBT. I don't want to break their heart by telling them I'm now self-harming. 
Um, the other thing, obviously, that young people told us about was um, being under 18. They couldn't access mental health services without parental consent. And for some of those who weren't out, that made it impossible for them. Um, and one of those ones, I suppose, that hit home for me, uh, I suppose, as an LGBT person was that very much, very many of them spoke about the mask that, that, that so many of us use and would employ to keep ourselves safe uh, in terms of hiding our gender identity or sexual orientation and only coming out or sharing that with people when it's safe. So all those skills, I suppose, and trips, tips and tricks that we've learned to keep ourselves safe sometimes get employed to hide what's really going on for us as well as so we mask when we're not feeling the best and when we are struggling we we so that's why so many of young people said that they can be out they can be on their youtube page or on social media portraying that everything is fine but behind the scenes we they, they may be very much struggling the LGBTI um, plus National Youth Strategy did a huge amount of consultation as well. Over 4,000 young people were, um, were uh, surveyed during that process. And, and what they, they named improving access to mental health services as a top priority for, for them. Our school climate report that was done last year, well, um, even some of the statistics, we knew that schools can be a, a very, um, sometimes very traumatic place for LGBT young people. And we knew from uh, uh, the LGBT Ireland report that school bullying was, uh, there was a causal link between um, that increased risk of mental health problems and bullying, as well as exclusion, isolation, um, and things like that. The school climate report, we found that 73% of young people don't feel safe in school. 77% um, of them have been verbally uh, harassed. 68% of them hear homophobic remarks from other students. 38% of them have been physically harassed, shoved or punched. And 11% of them have been physically assaulted, punched, kicked or uh, injured with a weapon and 39% of them had experienced cyberbullying. So the, it came from a, a kind of a wide um, angle of what may be seen by some as quite innocuous um, comments, um, but as described by a young person to me, uh, like a paper cut. So one paper cut isn't too bad, but if you get 10 paper cuts a day, five days a week, or seven days a week, sometimes if it's online, um, for year on year, that, that, that pa those paper cuts can add up. Right through the whole, as I've described, a verbal um, harassment, um, of damage to property, physical damage, right up to sexual abuse as well, sexual assault. And, and one young man spoke about how he'd been sexually assaulted for three years after PE because he was gay. So so the school um, climate in Ireland is, is currently not good for, for LGBT young people and, and, we, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also did a piece of work um, with uh, surveying young people about the lockdown and how what kind of an impact that was having on young people. 93% uh, of them said that they were struggling with mental health issues during lockdown, during COVID. And that was compared to 53% of the general youth population in the youth, uh, the Young Social Innovators survey that was carried out um, a month or two prior to that. 55% of those who responded said that they were struggling with suicide ideation and 45% of those who responded said they were struggling with self-harm. 42% of the young people who responded said that they weren't fully accepted at home and 60% were experiencing loneliness. So uh, it's unsurprising then that uh, from our own database, uh, what we were able to show is there has been an 88% increase in the number of young people in touch with us um, in the first nine months of this year compared to last year, directly, I suppose, related to COVID and lockdown. That sense of being in lockdown in a house where a you may not be out so that stress of having to hide uh, who you are or you are out and you aren't accepted at home so constantly negotiating um, homophobia transphobia biphobia um, and trying to stay safe and stay out of people's way um, in fact the interventions for, for young people in terms of the back and forth 
um, uh, with emails, telephone calls, um, they have increased by 250%. And the top three issues are remain coming out, um, mental health issues and challenges faced by trans young people. So coming out still uh, in this day and age, the biggest problem, and Agnes referred to some of the reasons why, it's that fear of rejection. Will my family accept me? Will my friends um, still like me? Will I be bullied in, in school? Um, and in fact, a piece of research that we did last year with the general population of, of students said that over 50% of school going children felt that in fact, yes, you would be bullied if you came out in, in post primary school in Ireland. So it's not based on um, uh, nothing at all. We, we, we know from both the general population of young people and LGBT young people that this is going on. We also know from our, our partners in Pieta um, who provide in-house, who pre-COVID were providing in-house counselling for young people who were um, struggling with self-harm and suicide ideation, that their numbers of LGBTI plus young people coming to them for support have gone up. And likewise, the crisis text line um, has said in re recently almost 40% uh, of the young people um, who are in touch with them are um, LGBT. So, so that's some of the evidence base. Um, so just to, in terms of young people then, what, um, some of the other things we know are um, that, that may, may explain some of the difficulties and some of the, the, uh, the lines, I suppose, in the graphs that Agnes showed was 12 is the most common age for a young person to really realize that they're LGBTI um, plus. 16 is the most common age for them to tell somebody else. So it's those four years that can be very lonely, very isolating time um, as they try to hide who they are. And that's what eats away at, at them, at shame. And it's also the time, I suppose, when um, we see spikes in self-harm and suicide ideation. So to move on to some of the solutions, I suppose, is really to re reduce the risk factors and increase the protective factors. Um, and some of the solutions, and there are more, but obviously, but some of the solutions that I, I just wanted to name today um, were around implementation of the LGBTI um, youth strategy. There's lots of various of different actions within the LGBT youth strategy in relation to um, reducing um, stigma and eliminating taboo in relation to both being LGBTI plus, but also in relation to mental health. Um, also in, in improved uh, actions around improving access to mental health uh, and sexual health services for LGBT young people, about responding effectively to their needs and, um, um, and then in relation to making spaces safer as well, including um, schools and, and youth services. We need to implement the Pathfinder. We need to implement the recommendations um, from the Youth Mental Health Task Force. Uh, in particular, um, in uh, opening up access to mental health services for under 18s. And we need to look at things like the Gillick principles in the UK um, so that uh, a, a young person um, has access to mental health professionals who can then uh, make, the, make uh, an informed decision about their capacity to give informed con consent um, when they need access to mental health support. Um, when in fact, you know, in some, for some young people coming out to get uh, to get parental consent could endanger their 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 lives or and their mental health and well being. Direct services we obviously need to build capacity with the mental health um, services through training and education. And I want to give a shameless plug to the wonderful training that um, Jigsaw and Belong to provide. Um, it's a one day training pre COVID. Now we've adapted it to, so it's online, it's on today. And um, there's a couple more running by the tip be, before the end of the year, but they are all booked up. We'll have more for next year. Um, so you can put your names on, on a waiting list if, if you want to. Um, and that'll give us more ammo to go back to funders so that we can do more of that training. Um, we need more specialist services as well. So, I mean, I think it's um, for a lot of, especially LGBT young people, they want to go to services that they know are going to be LGBT inclusive and friendly. Um, early intervention and prevention, and I know some of our young people in, in youth workers are going to talk about this um, later on, but we do need to increase um, access to specialist youth services, the LGBT youth services, so that both the, the digital and face-to-face 
young LGBT people tend to be um, online more than non-LGBT young people. So that space um, does suit um, very many of them, but not all. So we have a cohort of young people who it just doesn't for various different reasons. So we need to provide, increase our capacity um, nationwide for, for those services. We also need to make our schools and our youth services friendly. So we just, as um, uh, uh, was said by the name check by the minister at the beginning this morning, we need to, more schools in, in engaging in Stand Up Awareness Week every, every year, and we need more schools going through our Safe and Supportive Schools program, which is the whole school community approach, which looks at policy, training, the physical space, direct support to young people. Um, uh, we also need to support the professionals who support the young people. I mean, I don't know how many calls I've been on. Um, Lisa McKenney, our coordinator for the National Network, is, has been doing a great um, uh, job trying to support um, youth workers across Ireland. Uh, it's a, there's a peer support space. And some of the stories, obviously, they through lockdown, they've been, like us all, have been struggling as well. And then dealing with um, a suicide and self-harm um, within their youth group. So we really need to support them too. We need an uh, increase in LGBT community spaces, events, sports, arts, culture, all those kinds of things so that we can increase community spirit, increase um, safe spaces for LGBT people to come together. And we need to tackle hate crime um, uh, and prejudice. It's, it's, uh, we are in the community have noticed an increase in that in, in recent years. Um, so we're doing work on the legislative side, side working with um, the Gardaí in relation to prevention and detection. We need to provide better support for victims and reporting. Um, and we just need to decrease the prejudice that causes that in the first place. Um, and we need to tackle conversion therapy as well. Um, that's my shameless plug for the, for the training. And that's the shameless plug for the Safe and Supportive Schools program as well. Um, and Eddie, you can get more details of, of all of these on our website, belongto.org. I'm going to fly through these um, and just say thanks very much. Amazing, Marinya. Thank you so much. Uh, so lovely to hear you speak again. And I love your shameless plugs. <laughs> You really shouldn't be ashamed of them at all, because you're doing great work, and um, and and this is definitely the platform for it. I I am really quite shocked to hear that your survey compared to last year, eighty eight percent increase. <laughs> you have you're not sleeping anymore. That's it. They belong to the staff are working twenty four seven. Wow, eighty eight percent. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all, and. Um, because we've seen it in our services as well. And I thank you for making that point about uh, young people being forced to be indoors with sadly, sometimes families that are not supportive of their identity. And some of them have felt they had to go back into the closet just so they can just survive um, the foreseeable future, which is, uh, which is shocking. And, and just going back to what Agnes was saying, you know, parental rejection. I think a lot of people are very surprised that in this day and age, in 2020, that the parental rejection happens. And indeed it does. Uh, and that's why you know, Molina uh, and uh, Agnes spoke about it, uh, because there's still parents today. And, and I really feel, you know, the sexuality piece is still there. It's still prevalent, but it's the trans and the intersex piece. And I've, I've heard it from parents themselves saying it um, uh, when they access our services, you know, if my child had come out as gay or lesbian or bisexual or pansexual, you know, I, I would have got managed, I would have managed to get my head around it. But now they're telling me they're trans and they're intersex. They, they're just, you know, they're, you can see that they're really struggling. So there is a massive piece of work in relation to uh, just bridging that gap, you know, so sexuality yeah. or gender identity. But just not to diminish the experience of, of lesbian and gay people, uh, especially in schools, because what we're finding is um, the, the people who are picked on the most are uh, young people who don't, uh, I suppose, who are outside the gender norms. So boys who are particularly camp or girls are particularly butch um, and trans young people who don't pass. Um, so it's uh, it's still tough to be lesbian or gay in school, as well as trans. Absolutely. So, so uh, it's getting the awareness up, because again, people can fall back and be complaints. So, ah, it's 2020. They're getting married. They're 
kids have, you know, parent, parental rights now and sure it's all great, but it's not. Uh, just actually over the weekend and we, next person is going to be talking talk about the older LGBT community, which I'm very close, very slowly edging towards as I turn 50 in about two years. Uh, just over the weekend, I was in Tesco's and I went to the bathroom with my two kids and I went into the ladies' bathroom and uh, one of the staff, Tesco staff members actually looked at me and said, this is the woman's toilet. And I was like, I know, you know, and then I, 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 I was like, you know, as someone who was quite vocal, I was like, do I, I need to do something. I need to say something. Amory, what do you think? And Amory was like, this is going to ruin your Sunday. Go do something. So I went and complained to the, the, the head of the store and she listened, she empathized and she apologized. And she said, she's going to make sure that's not going to happen again. I said, look, I'm not doing all this for myself, but also doing it for the trans people who might be using your facilities and you're going to, you know, misgender them. And that's not good. Right. So that's me off with my rant. Now, as I was talking about older people, um, we are joined my, by Sean Vale. And Sean joins us all the way from um, Skibbereen. Uh, and Sean is a member of uh, LGBT Island Older and Bolder online group. He's currently in Skibbereen and he has a background in mental health and education and has one of the most fantastically interesting life stories you'll ever hear. I can't wait. Sean, where are you? Hello. Good morning to you. Good morning to you, Sean. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm here to represent the older and bolder people. Uh, I, I, I have to ask myself exactly what age group is that? I'm over 60 myself. And sometimes I say, how did I make it to this age? <laughs> so what I would like to do is to start with telling you a little bit about my background and give you a little bit more about a who, what, where, and why kind of situation. Um, I have a background as a physiotherapist and I have, I have worked in pain management, which has connected me to a lot of psychology, um, which has connected me to other areas uh, regarding uh, LGBTI issues. So let's go back to me as a 17 year old young fella. And it was made a decision from my family for me to go into the Navy to butch me up. So I joined the uh, American Navy, went into the submarine fleet. In two short years of trying to figure out sexuality and many other different aspects of my life. I met a young fella, uh, we clicked, we fell in love, and we had a, a year of wonderful uh, times. And unfortunately, that young man drowned and I lost my lover. So I couldn't stand the anguish. I went to my commanding officer and I said, look, I'm, I'm gay and this isn't going to work. I've just lost my partner and I'm, I'm very distraught. So I was one of the first people in the American Navy to be honorably discharged for being a homosexual. So that in itself was an accomplishment, but look, I was really, really distressed. I came home to a family who said, no, no, this, is a, this isn't on. Um, I was actually told, this is what God does to people like you, so change. Well, clearly that wasn't going to happen. I had the most overwhelming grief. And with, with that came depression, anxiety, uh, an inability to function on a daily basis. I didn't have family to support me. So I had to go out and I had to develop 
family of my own. I had to go and meet people and bring those people into my life. A very, very vulnerable time because you are bringing people that you don't really know their background. Um, you're sussing them out as you're building your trust. But this is what happens. You bring in people, you build up your own kind of circle of support. So I found that I had this resilience and that resilience is really what saw me through the, 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 the next 10, 20 years of my life. Um, that resilience could have gone the other way. Um, there were many people that I knew that, that, that just didn't have the support and unfortunately committed suicide. Long about the same time, 1981, was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. We didn't even call it AIDS back then. It was gay-related immune deficiency syndrome. And that in itself was creating um, a stigma in society against LGBTI people. Uh, and let alone, you know, my, my, my biological family. Things still hadn't healed after many, many years. So what was it that I was looking for? I knew there was something wrong. I, I didn't want to just jump out there to the mental health services and say, I'm broken, fix me, because I knew that wasn't gonna happen. What I was looking for Number one, support, but as well what I was looking for were people that I could speak to, that I could put my trust in, that would have had the ability to facilitate my getting better. So looking for those non-judgmental people, looking for people who were knowledgeable, sensitive, um, who were informed on exactly why life was different for me. Long-term discrimination in itself, being bullied from a child all the way up on into later years, that in itself causes a, a, a depression and an anxiety that is sometimes overwhelming, most of the time overwhelming. I found solace in my community. This is in America, as you can tell by my accent. Um, I, I started to mend, but circumstances changed. I had to come home to my family home in West Cork. Um, I arrived here in 1991 with anguish and grief. And I got straight into working into the family businesses, a, a huge uh, business empire. And with my family here uh, all day long, uh, my sister said, please don't let anyone know that you're gay in the village. You'll be chewed apart. Just please don't do it. And we don't want the reflection as a family as if it was a terrible thing. Wow, all this culmination just piled up on top of me. And I knew I had to do something about it. Now, rural Ireland, Bantry and West Cork, there's just, there wasn't anything for me. There just was not the facilities out there. So I, again, was at that point saying, well, you're going to have to go out and, and, and look and, and create this support circle yourself. That was a job. I, 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 I have to say it was more difficult than I thought here. Because again, here we have that stigma again. I remember when I first arrived here in 1991, I think it was still, or I believe it was still illegal to buy a condom outside of a pharmacy. I believe you had to have a prescription. 
but I think in 1993 they changed it so that you could you could uh, buy condoms uh, in in a in a a toilet in a pub or or, or such. But this was this was in a in a rural community as well. Um, there were a lot of uh, religious attitudes. Um, there were some cultural attitudes as well in there. But I was lost. I didn't know what to do. So I, I went to my community. I did find solace in, in Cork City, a very small but active community. And that, that helped me. That helped me immensely just to know. Now, what we're talking about from Bantry to Cork City at that time was an hour and 25 minutes up to Cork City and the same time going back. So whatever time you stayed in Cork, it made for a long drive. Um, very difficult sometimes to go up for an appointment. Um, there, within, the within the community though, I, I didn't find that, uh, I didn't find what I was looking for as, as far as somebody to underpin me. Um, what I was looking for, and this is the most important word for myself um, and, and for me to share, I needed someone to help me empower myself. I needed that support and I needed guidance to, to reach my full potential. It, that eventually came about. And mm, I had, for, for all intents and purposes, uh, a normal life, which I, 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 I can't say was, was, was very normal. I've had some wonderful and crazy experiences in my life, but I've demanded a lot out of life. In 2016, we're gonna jump forward here because I wanna try to get as much in as possible. In 2016, I was diagnosed with colon cancer and only given months to live. Somehow that resilience that I learned early on in my life I was able to put into play again. And I started a road of recovery. And well, as you can see, I'm, I'm here today. That's four years ago. In that interim period, as a 58-year-old man who was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and I went through intense surgery um, to remove the cancers. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a completely different situation. I'm an older, single, gay man, and I'm reliant on services, home care services. I just touch on this one for, for, for an example. Home care services bringing people into my home and, and, and that vulnerability of them finding out my sexual orientation and how are they going to treat me? How are they going to react to my sexuality? Are they going to be okay with it? Is it gonna prevent them from taking care of me properly? I had to have assistance going to the toilet. I had to have assistance um, bathing. There, there were many different aspects of my daily living that I needed help with, especially within the first six months after my surgery. So that's just an example of, of, of what, um, what challenges that, that I was facing. I had never even talked to anyone about funeral arrangements or what happens when you get old, let alone, you know, um, in, in a short period of time, bombarded with all of these requests to make decisions. I think the hardest thing for me was coping with the changes within my own body. I wanted to go on. I had a zest to live. I wanted to get back out there. I knew there were other people in the LGBTI community who had to be going through the same thing. And I wanted to be able to help um, those in my community. 
use my background, my experiences, now this new situation and, and, and take this forward. I think it was one of my driving forces to be quite honest. So I arrive at a point where now I'm going to be 62 years old. I have a disability. I, I have many issues uh, physically, but I don't let them stop me. I get up every morning and I fight through them. It's a tenacity that I've developed and I want other people to know how to do that. I became involved with the, um, with the Older and Boulder group uh, over the internet, which has been great because here I'm rural, I'm really isolated. Although in saying that in the uh, 10 houses that are in my terrace, three of us are of the LGBTI community. So that's a pretty good odds for, for a row of houses in, in, in a rural town in Ireland. And they're wonderful people too, absolutely. So here we are um, with, with me reaching out now and trying to develop um, a group, an association, something where we, we can bring people in other rural areas together. We, we have a, a coffee chat every Thursday at three o'clock on the Older and Boulder website. You can get the information there. And that's great. I really look forward to that. Um, it's a time where I can go in for, for uh, a, an hour and I can um, have uh, contact with with, with other individuals where we have like-minded ideas or we can, con um, we can contemplate things. Recently, we've, we've had a little topic that we can, we can share information on. I think the next one is our coming out stories if you wish to share them. So there's, um, there's a lot going on. Um, and I think what, as, as the, 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 the older people see, Right at this moment in time, it's a, it's a conglomeration of many generations of LGBTI people coming together now here in this platform. We have, we can't paint everything with the same brush. So in, in order to tackle certain situations, we really have to research and become aware. I'm, I'm working independently at the moment doing research and trying to come up with um, uh, community activities that include those people in, in, in the rural areas around Ireland. Sean, sorry to come in, we're just running out of time. Uh, if, you, if you just have a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Well, great, that's, 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 that's not a problem. I'm gonna wind up there anyway, Dill. Um, I want to thank everyone today for their wonderful input. And um, I hope that my story can be um, uh, insightful for, for, for others. Thank you so much, you. Sean. Thank and you very much. my introduction was right. You have had a fantastically interesting. Um, we must, we must all go down to Skibreen and, and, and meet Sean. I just love the fact that there's 10 houses in a row and three of them are, are a, part, a part of the LGBTQ community. So those, those odds are pretty good. So if I can ask the three panelists to switch on your videos, uh, Agnes, Moninia and Sean, uh, we have a, a few questions for you. Um, and we, we, are, we are running terribly over um, uh, because the, all your presentations have been so interesting, uh, but let's, uh, Let's, let's go to, over to the questions. First of all, thank you so much for all the lovely comments uh, that, are, that are coming through. People are joining us from all over Ireland. People have been sharing a lot of their uh, wellness tips and a lot of them involve swimming in the cold ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, but no thanks for me. <laughs> as a as a Sri Lankan, I yeah, I think I can only swim uh, in in the Irish Sea in in the in the midst of summer. I couldn't couldn't cope during the winter. Uh, the whole Wim Hof thing is a little bit uh, lost on me. Uh, okay, so um, some questions here. We have uh, Maeve from Dublin. Has any research been done into physical health and fitness levels in the LGBTQI plus community? I know that weight issues can be caused by mental health problems. So perhaps it's worse in the LGBT 
LGBTQ uh, plus community. I don't know about you, but the first lockdown I managed to, my waistline didn't suffer as much as the second lockdown. <laughs> this trying to find a pair of pants that fit was a bit of a uh, difficult for me but who would like to take that in relation to um the physical health and fitness of the lgbtqi plus by the way there's good news about the gaa they're hoping they're setting up a club for the lgbtqi plus isn't that brilliant what what do you think of those thoughts any thoughts on that there's quite a bit of work done on physical health and mental health but in terms of uh within the specific LGBTI community, I don't think there's anything, not that I know of in Ireland. Uh, and there, it, we say internationally, we would, there would be, you know, within studies, there might be kind of looked at kind of obesity levels. Uh, there are some studies looked at kind of multiple morbidity, physical health issues in relation to LGBTI community, but it's mainly within the US. Uh, it's certainly not that I'm aware of within Ireland that we have um, started. And I suppose that's, you know, when I think, you know, Visible Lives would have been the first kind of study that was done on uh, with older LGBT people. And Sean, it's, it's lovely to, to uh, hear your story. And it certainly it is an amazing story. Um, and LGBT Ireland would kind of would, would be one of the larger studies with the in, within Ireland and we didn't look at physical health and we didn't look at kind of uh, weight issues or that within that uh, unless money and you, you know of anything no but I do know that in the recent report how's your head which was uh, uh, Department children and youth affairs with spun out uh, they did ask, so there was, a, um, uh, I think, about 20% of the respondents identified as LGBTI+. Plus, um, and what they were able to show is, so the, the, that they, the, that cohort of respondents were struggling more, um, no surprise, that correlated with their own survey. But they did also uh, show that they were less likely to exercise or to have an exercise routine. They were less physically active. Um, so there could be a, a connection there. And we also know from the work that we've done in schools that because of uh, because locker rooms, changing rooms um, tend to be an area that young people feel vulnerable in. Um, what a lot happens a lot of times as for LGBT young people is they get out of having to do PE, they get out of having to do sport, they, they, do, they don't turn up to school on those days or they, or they find excuses because of the bullying. So then they're less likely then to go on to have, uh, you know, a sport, um, an interest in sport outside school. Um, and, you know, so, th so there's great work going on with groups, lots of uh, sporting, LGBT sporting groups out there, uh, uh, sporting pride, the front runners. I was part of those for years. I, I tell, I found them, found that amazing for my mental health, you know, um, there's the physical exercise, but there's also just meeting other LGBT people. So, um, but yeah, I don't think there's any specific piece of study in relation to it. And I think the, 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 the GA, you know, LGBTQI plus club is, is going to play a big part because I, I, I know with all the conversations I've had with uh, say, Sporting Pride, it's been very much, you know, a lot of the LGBTQI plus people tend to turn back to sport in their later years because when they were young, they felt they were not accepted. They, did, they didn't feel comfortable. So unfortunately, even though they were very talented, many of them, they just shied away from running or taking part of any, any sports. So a lot of them uh, are taking part now. And then not, not only that, they're representing Ireland in the gay games and they did extremely well as well. So woohoo uh, for that. So, okay. So the, another question here is, um, Georgina has asked, where can we get access to these studies? Yeah, I mean, your, your PowerPoint presentations were incredible. Is there any way, first of all, that our participants can access those? Because I'd love them to share them with their colleagues. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, if mental health reform are putting them up, they, I have absolutely uh, no problem um, sharing them. And in terms of the, the studies, that uh, like the LGBT Ireland study is online. Um, and it's uh, it certainly are in connected in, in belong to. Um, but if people wanted to email me on anything in terms of a study, I can certainly let them have it. Uh, if it's on my computer, I always say I have absolutely no problem sharing it with people. Uh, 
and like my email is really simple a higgins at tcd.ie be on to you about my thesis agnes what about your presentation and your dissertation? yeah absolutely happy to share that and there is a, a, a page on our website belong to.org if you go to professionals scroll down it says lgbti plus research and we have links then to um the the reports that i referred to and and of course to the the big tome the um actually i think it's just the key findings we have on but 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 um uh, we can send on a soft copy of the the lgbt ireland as well yeah great uh, linda who is a mental health social worker uh, commented to say great presentation from agnes agree on the importance not to pathologize lgbt identities so a big thank you there from linda Damien says, Mourinha painting the reality of what it's like in secondary schools. The amendment of 37.1 of the Employment Equality Act might lead one to believe that LGBTQI plus teachers are now more confident about being out. Research proves other than this. We still need to work on this. Uh, Mourinha, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And when we launched our school climate report last year, um, we had Dermot de, de Puer from ASTI at, at, the, at that. He's on the share, share the panel with um, with Agnes. And he made that very point. He said, um, you know, how can we expect we need role models? Young people need role models. And how can we expect young people to feel safe in school when the LGBT teachers in school aren't don't feel safe in school to be out? So, um, so that, that that is a problem, and I know that that that's the case. You know, I know, um, uh, I, I know from friends who who they will go to schools, they go, will go and work in schools where they know they can be out because there are still some schools where they can't, and they and they have to sit in a staff room and hide. Um, and what happens then is what we saw in the school climate report is there are teachers then who won't address homophobic bullying and transphobic bullying when they hear it or see it happening in schools. And that compounds the trauma for young people because here is an adult who's supposed to um, stick up for them, have their backs. Um, and sometimes you, you have to wonder, are, are, is that because some of them are LGBT teachers themselves and they're just trying to keep their heads above the water themselves? So. So we need to make schools safe for teachers as well. Absolutely. Uh, lots of comments coming in, uh, Sean, uh, about your story and how absolutely inspirational you are. Um, God, you in the, I love, I love what you said. You joined the, 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 the Navy to, to boot up. That's, uh, I, I know, you know, I've met so many men who have done that, who have done that and uh, and it's, a, it's so it's, it's your, your, now that you've come to Ireland and you're living in, in Skibreen, you're like a like a national treasure. Uh, please keep sharing sharing the story because uh, I, I often wonder, you know, because you're talking about the care um, services that you are you are um, uh, accessing, you know. So as you get older, we all need more support. And I'm thinking our, our nursing homes, you know, I, I want my nursing home. Yes that I want to go to to have a disco ball and I wanted to have piped Madonna music on a loop all day, you know? So this is, these are the things that matter to us. Let's set that up, Dil. Yeah, let's do it. I'm sure. Uh, no, because that's the thing. Well, uh, I'm going to that nursing home as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, because this is the thing. I have heard so many older LGBT people said that the, the older they were getting, they, they found themselves going back into the closet. Yeah, um, absolutely. Is absolutely. that a common story you hear? Yeah, I, I've, I've run across um, older, older LGBT uh, members of the community who are in nursing homes who have had to close the closet door again because, again, those cultural differences from the people that are coming in to take care and, you know, actually feeling quite abused. You know, because they're 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 not being taken serious. The things like unconscious bias training is, is so important for for staff in uh, in in the front line. Uh, Absolutely. There's, there's a question here about uh, next step, um, which is based in Cork. Are you familiar with it? Uh, and as people are wondering if uh, if it's uh, if people from other counties can access the service. Does anyone have any information about Next Step? No. I don't have information on it. I'm familiar with it, but not yeah. to okay. speak for them. 
Okay, yeah, it, it just came up, so I thought I'll, I'll, I'll flag it with you. All right, and people want to get in contact with the panelists, can they message us? Uh, and can we share your contact details with them? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Okay. Get ready to be inundated, folks, because your presentations this morning were absolutely superb. Thank you so much for, for sharing your time and your wisdom uh, with us. And of course, for all the incredible work that we are that you are doing uh, in uh, creating a, a safer space and ed really educating the services um, and, and the representatives today, because they, I hope everybody will go back to their services and talk about everything they heard today. So thank you, Munir Griffith, CEO of Belong to Professor Agnes uh, Higgins. Um, for who, who spoke earlier on, and then of course Sean Vale, all the way from Skibbereen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Up the All right. <laughs>